Probably seen as one of life's biggest questions is the constantly pestering thought that we all have every now and then that could lead us down a rabbit hole of existential crisis and curiosity. What exactly happens to us when we die and what actually does it mean to die? In our modern age, science and medicine has made tremendous strides in the field of neuroscience, understanding the mechanisms of the physical body and even the last bits of chemicals released throughout the brain when someone begins to slowly fade away from existence. But despite this knowledge, there is still a lot more to be understood and theorized about what happens to the human body when we die than what is currently understood. So today, here at Unexplained Mysteries, we will be going over these theories and groundbreaking scientific research in an attempt to better understand what exactly happens to us when we die. The Physiological Reaction Many people are unaware of the fact that when a person dies, the cells in the body can remain active for a very long period of time. Death is then defined by the medical professionals at the ceasing of the pulse, the absence of breathing, the absence of reflexes, and the lack of a pupillary constriction in response to a bright light being shown directly into the eye, which are all signs that an individual has begun the process of an irreversible death and can no longer be resuscitated with current technology. For the sake of the definition of death, we will begin here when describing the physiological response the body has when undergoing the process of dying. At the moment of death, all of the muscles throughout the body will immediately begin to relax and go limp, a state of which is medically referred to as primary flaccidity. This relaxation of the muscles causes eyelids to open, jaws to drop, waist to pass, and the body's core temperature to begin to rapidly drop by roughly 2 degrees Celsius within the first hour and 1 degree Celsius each hour that follows until reaching the ambient room temperature surrounding the cadaver. After 2 to 6 hours, the body will begin to develop bruising as the blood starts to coagulate throughout the larger veins and wherever the blood has pooled inside the body. This is immediately followed by a variety of chemical reactions that occur all throughout the body, known by its medical term as rigor mortis, that causes the muscles to stiffen throughout the body. This continues until about 12 hours after death, in which the chemical processes throughout the body cause the muscles to relax once again in a process known as secondary flaccidity, in which rigor mortis stops and the skin will begin to tighten, giving the illusion that hair and fingernails continue to grow. This process will continue for several days as the body undergoes decomposition and eventual total cell death down the line. The brain's reaction. Probably seen as the scariest revelation that neuroscience has provided for the understanding of the action of dying is the fact that the brain can persist for roughly 10 minutes after death occurs. This has led many scientists to believe that not only is the human brain well aware of its imminent death, but that strange attempts to preserve one's life is taken by the brain moments before everything ends. Evidence of this can be seen when a clinical death occurs and though a patient may be unconscious and the heart still absent of any pulse, the brain will begin sending out electrical signals to the body to begin involuntary gasping for air that can cause many first response medics to falsely believe the person has regained consciousness or that CPR efforts can be stopped altogether. Roughly four minutes after clinical death, the brain will begin to undergo a tremendous amount of ischemic injury. Ischemic injury is a common injury that accumulates in all the tissues and organs of an injured body that has a lack of blood circulation passing through it. These range in damage when comparing different tissues and organs, such as how detached limbs can be successfully reattached after six hours of no blood circulation and much warmer temperatures, considering the fact that ischemic injury does not act as quickly. However, with the brain, it happens in as little as a few minutes. At this point in time, the brain will begin to release a plethora of chemicals and hormones, such as oxytocin and cortisol, to dull the pain and generate waves of pleasure in response to the trauma before slowly fading away and suddenly ceasing of all electrical activity. The weight of the soul. 
Many different cultures and religions from around the world believe in a unified stance when it comes to the idea of an immortal spirit or an everlasting soul. Ranging in names throughout the world from the Atman, spiritual energy, true consciousness or the soul, many argue that it is through this undying energy that, even after our body fades, we will still continue long after. Oddly enough, evidence of this has been gathered in the scientific community that is more than a few decades old. It appears that back in 1907, a scientific study was published by a man named Duncan McDougall of whom had hypothesized that if the human soul truly existed, then it should, to some extent, have a measurable force or weight that could be classified upon a person's death when the soul was expected to vacate the body and continue on its journey into the afterlife. This led Duncan McDougall to begin his rather unethical experiments of attempting to measure the weight of the human soul by measuring the total weight of his patients before and after they had passed away. To acquire the number of patients necessary for his experiments, he would often visit local nursing homes in the hopes of finding a likely near-death candidate to help him with his research with their permission. On his search, he found a total of six different patients, four of which were suffering from tuberculosis and nearing the ends of their lives as the illness at the time was seen as a death sentence for the elderly. One suffering from diabetes, of which had no real treatment at the time due to lack of insulin developments, and one with unspecified causes that was leading to them soon passing away. When the patients appeared to be close to death, Duncan McDougall would then place them and their entire bed on an industrial-sized scale that was sensitive to within two-tenths of an ounce, roughly 5.6 grams. Unfortunately, two of his selected patients passed away before he could finish calibrating the machine, and so he was only able to measure the weight of four of his selected patients which showed evidence of weight being lost at the time of death that was calculated to be equal to roughly 21 grams. Many skeptics claimed that this weight loss could have been achieved by other means rather than evidence of a soul, arguing that it could have been caused by a person's last breath, an argument we now know in the modern age to not be applicable due to the fact that air pressure is always equal regardless of someone exhaling their breath, or that sweat glands or defecation was responsible for the weight loss at the time of death. An argument obviously debunked as Duncan McDougall later posted his findings in the scientific journal that also included how the weight of such actions was already accounted for given the fact that the industrial-sized scale would have contained any leaked bodily fluids. Unfortunately, due to the stigma of invisible energy theorists that would later be proven correct in their theories on electromagnetism and the electromagnetic spectrum, many of the scientists at this time completely rejected this idea going as far as having Duncan McDougall ridiculed, his work removed from the scientific journal and even his reputation destroyed. Not only did no other scientists even try to replicate his experiments or tested the hypothesis for themselves, they regarded anyone who even attempted as indulging in delusions and would mean the complete rejection of their work as well. This could very well mean that, scientifically, shortly after the time of death, your soul will then begin to leave your body and persist long after your body has faded away. Theories on the afterlife Of course, the existence of an everlasting soul does not help to explain what might happen after one experiences death. In fact, it appears to be one of the main topics that religions and cultures around the world cannot seem to agree on. Some argue that a form of reincarnation can occur that can include someone coming back to finish a goal they had set out to do, taking the form of another species such as a plant or an animal or even something as strange as becoming a part of an inanimate object such as a rock or a mountain. Others argue that the soul goes through some form of judgement that decides on the everlasting fate of the individual based on their actions made during their life. This can range from the Egyptian mythological representation that claims a person's heart is weighed before they begin on their journey through the stars, whereas monotheistic religions believe judgment occurs during the life of the individual itself and that their actions are taken into consideration on whether they are accepted into a world of constant peace and happiness or torture and pain. Some even argue that perhaps the energy stays right where it is 
and that evidence of ghosts and spirits are more than abundant in our natural world, proving that life after death more than persists. Unfortunately, no one knows what happens after death, but given the recent incredible scientific advancements, fairly soon the mystery as to what happens after death could be nothing more than chapter 18 in a science book. But what do you all think of this strange discovery made about the human soul, and what is it you believe happens to you after you die? Be sure to leave your questions and answers in the comment section below, and help us to grow this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to subscribe for more videos. Thank you.